Welcome back to the show. We're talking about the Group of Seven, also known as the G7. What relevance does this international group of top industrialized nations have in a changing world? Let's go to Vladimir in uh, Rhode Island. Uh, Vladimir, you've got countries like Russia, China, India. They're not included in the G7, and neither are any African or Latin American countries. What about the criticism that the G7 is ignoring the needs of the developing world, for one? Yeah, I mean, we have to look a little bit at the history of G7. And they started, you know, in, in 75, uh, say, 30 years after the Second World War, when European uh, countries uh, became major players, Germany and France and others, which were devastated by the war. Now they became new economic reality, and it, it made t uh, perfect sense for their leaders to get together and discuss things. Well, now it's 2016. It's another uh, different reality. We have BRIC countries, you know, major player Japan, um, sorry, major player uh, China, major player Russia, uh, you know, Latin American countries, African. So I think G7 have to somehow kind of uh, approach these issues differently. You know, if they approach things from perspective of economic players, definitely both China and Russia have to be included. And this economic thing should consider uh, events in, you know, Africa and consider South Africa and other countries. If they're talking about politics, then it's also a very serious issue. Politics have to be considered probably within the uh, context of economics, rather than the, uh, bringing sanctions and doing this and that. You know, just I can imagine uh, G7 would decide to, to uh, bring China in. And then there will be debates over which we've heard uh, right now. And then uh, Japan will insist, or other countries, or US will insist, which likes to be the leader over everything, will insist, we're kicking you out. I don't think this is a productive way of approaching things. Of just uh, uh, that's exactly what they did with Russia. You know, they, they brought Russia in. Russia tried to participate. Russia tried to sort of be a, a player. Okay, uh, there are serious disagreements about Russian politics in Ukraine, but it's hardly uh, a, a reason for turning uh, G7 into this political forum uh, of you know uh, of, of introducing more and more sanctions against Russia and eventually kicking it out. So I think my feeling is that G seven have to reconsider its role because otherwise it's losing uh, its relevance. All right, That's Peter, my view of it. All right, Peter, what is your view on this? I mean, as Vladimir points out, the origins of the G seven were in the seventies. It was formally established in nineteen eighty five and the world has changed significantly since then. I mean, the world has changed significantly since then. I, I'm a little bit surprised to hear uh, Vladimir say, well, you know, you, you have world leaders get together and, and perhaps like a scene out of Casablanca, we're shocked, shocked, shocked that there are politics going on here. <laughs> I mean, you can't separate, you know, politics, security, and economy, you know, in the current world. I, I certainly agree that there's no question that the G7 has a, a different role and represents a reduced a percentage of the global economy than it did uh, 40 years ago, which is why we're seeing not only you know, we were the maintenance of the G7, but the emergence of the G20 to reflect a, a changing environment. And I think over time, the importance of the G7 or the G20 mm -hmm. will only increase. Uh, that doesn't make the fact that you have the world's yeah, yeah. leading economies and the world's most developed democracies that have a chance to get together, uh, minus the BRIC countries. Um, you know, they're, they're, you know, we have lots of international fora. I would argue that any time you have global leaders can get together in any combination, that is a productive and important aspect. So you have the G7, you know, which is a kind of a Western club you know, plus Japan, right. and, and then you also have the SCO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, that has some of the other countries represented, but not the United States. That's fine. Shihoko, uh, you know, in the 21st century, we see the Asia-Pacific region, which has now a lot more economic clout. Uh, you know, the political center has shifted a little bit. Um, and we've got the G20, which, of course, includes countries like China, like South Korea, like India. So is the G20 more reflective of today's world economy? I think we have to take a step back and uh, think through what the G7 is and what the G20 is. Um, the G7, of course, is not an official um, 
organization. There is no central secretariat. Uh, it's an informal gathering. It has, yes, uh, as other speakers have mentioned, it has lost some of its uh, clout and influence over the years. But nonetheless, it remains an opportunity for countries' leaders to actually get together um, and work towards a common um, interest and, and common objectives. The G20 is more reflective insofar as it represents a greater number of countries. But I don't think the G7 and the G20 should be mutually exclusive unto themselves. Victor, the G7 has also been described as a rich man's club that's designed to promote the interests of the United States and its allies. And some have dismissed it as a Cold War relic. What's your overall assessment? Well, I would say any countries in the world have the right to gather together in, among their leaders and talk about whatever they think is necessary. However, for G7 to hold itself as a representative group of countries in the world is becoming increasingly an anomaly. And I think the world has grown very, very differently very, very differently than what the G7 countries hold themselves out to be. For example, when the G7 foreign ministers issue a statement about the South China Sea and the East China Sea from the Chinese perspective, from the 1.36 billion Chinese people's perspective, it's hypocrisy. It's double standard. They are talking about things in a very unconstructive way, which may actually make it less likely that peace and negotiation and diplomacy may prevail for solving these issues. Therefore, I would say definitely G20 is much more representative of the world today, representing both the developed countries and the developing countries for any grouping of developed countries themselves to hold themselves as out as representative of the world or a big segment of the world is increasingly outdated. Vladimir, do you think so as well, that the G7 is a biased organization that deals with world issues in a, as Victor told us, unconstructive way. I, I would agree with that. But, you know, I think we have to look at the purpose of it. What, what, it, what is clear to me is the predominant role of the United States in G7 and its attempt to uh, round up these major industrial countries in the way they see fit. So the minute there is, you know, some split in Europe, but let's consider a map of Europe. Russia is in Europe. Russia should be in G7. I'm not sure U.S. should be in G7 because it's way far away from Europe. Yet U.S. is in G7, tells uh, French and, you know, and German who are very, uh, very happy to follow the line what to do and exclude Russia or do this or do that and tries to impose its vision, which, by the way, by 2016 lost its luster. Maybe in 75, U.S. vision of democracy in economics was the only one. Now we see other countries, China, Russia, many other countries trying to follow their own mod uh, models of development. So for U.S. to try to hold these you know, European countries hostages and tell them how to do and how to vote in, in, within the format of G7, I think it is redundant. PJ, is that what the G7 has become, an extension of uh, what the U.S. wants in the world? It just gets the other six countries well, to toe the line. I, I don't think, I don't know that anyone who has suggested that the G7 is representative in a global aspect other than representing the leading economies in the world and the leading democracies in the world. You know, beyond that, inside that membership is great diversity between the United States you know, in the Western Hemisphere, several European countries, Japan, you know, in, in the East, you know, but, but it does have a global perspective and brings that to, you know, that particular forum. Um, and, and, you know, but it, it, it is a forum through which, you know, these countries can reflect on uh, global developments, whether it's developments in the East and South China Seas on the one hand, you know, climate change or other issues that, uh, that have global significance. Uh, Victor, the G20 summit, of course, will be taking place in China later this year. Um, what do you expect will happen there? Is it going to be a lot more re relevant than what we're hearing coming out of Hiroshima right now? Uh, China is uh, spending a lot of efforts and resources in uh, preparing and organizing the G20 meeting uh, later this year. And I 
do believe that the G20 will represent, uh, you know, the majority of the people in the world in a much more uh, representative manner. You know, uh, the uh, speaker just now mentioned G7 as representative of the global view. I would venture to add that any view uh, without reflecting the Chinese view, which accounts for about 20 percent of the people in the world, is not a global view, is not a representative of the uh, mankind's opinion. And any view out of G7, which pits itself against China, right. is not representative of the world. Yeah, and China does not care I, I think about I said, that. I said that the, it represents a global view, a, you know, if, if you get leaders representing somewhere between It's not a global view. Well, 25 It's not a global view. It's a, the, it's a view of the, of the G7. That is a global view. You know, that... Um, it's I, not I'm a not global saying, view. I'm it's a view that, of the G7. I, I think the four of us probably absolutely agree that as things evolve, the G20 is going to become a, a far more significant forum. Right. But that doesn't necessarily mean that when seven world leaders... The G7 view is together, not a global view. That doesn't have significance. But I think the G7 has yeah. been successful in meeting some of the global challenges. I'm thinking specifically on the ability to um, get central banks to coordinate and intervene in markets and have a monetary policy that is effective for global markets. And what we're seeing right now is that there are many, many issues that transcend national boundaries. And the reason why the G7 still remains relevant today is not just because it represents some of the world's wealthiest countries, but they're able to define and try to seek common ground to find solutions for those problems, be it uh, global terror or migration issues or cybersecurity. And if you do increase that number of, of members in the G7, then it becomes harder to find solutions. It might be easy to identify them, but it will be more difficult to find common ground. All right. I'm afraid that's where we're going to have to leave it. We've run out of time.